Welcome to Two Wheels, and on this week's show, Wayne describes some of the aftermarket parts available to tweak your suspension. Jeff will be here with his weekly tech talk, and it's the final day of our Moroccan desert tour. But first, we sent motorcycle journalist Chris Moss along to Bruntingthorpe to check out a world record attempt. Today we're at the Bruntingthorpe Proving Ground in Leicestershire. This is where you can thrash cars, bikes and even planes to the absolute limit. And today we're here to witness a very special attempt. It's a land speed record attempt on a quad. Today it's rider Graham Hicks will attempt to break his own speed record which stands at 99 miles per hour. Now I know on the face of it that doesn't sound very fast at all. But when I tell you that Graham can't see or hear a single thing, yeah, that's right, he's both blind and deaf completely, then you've got to admit that it's a bit of a crazy venture. I reckon the man's completely mad. A man vital to today's proceedings is Rob Hall, who, uh, for sake of argument, I think we'll describe as Chief Navigator. Rob, it's your job to help Graham navigate down the strip at Bruntingthorpe. Tell me what's involved with that. Uh, well, I'm sitting behind him, um, I'm holding on, and I tap his side to change direction. I squeeze my legs when I want him to go faster, and uh, I pull back on him when I want him to stop. And really, that's about it. And is he quite obedient to your command, sir? He has to be. Um, he, he knows that I'm only steering him when I, we need to be steered and he reacts straight away. He's very good. How long have you worked with him, Rob? Uh, since last March. And uh, Were you involved in the previous attempt as well? Uh, well, I was working behind the scenes then and uh, helping to organise it and now I've stepped onto the pillion seat to, uh, to carry it through. Uh, you weren't involved at the last record attempt uh, as far as a navigator was concerned. Who, who did that job then? Uh, it was Matt Coulter, the kangaroo kid. He's a stunt rider, is that true? Yes, uh, especially for quads. And uh, they, they, broke, well, they set the record last year on uh, Matt's own quad. Uh, this year we've built our own uh, more powerful machine. Um, and, and back then it was a 500cc machine. What sort of engine did it have in those days? It was a, a Suzuki uh, Square 4 two-stroke. Oh, the RG500? Yes. OK. Yeah, now we've got a 1100 Honda fuel-injected. A um, lot more power, a um, lot more speed, we hope. Right, the man behind this crazy four-wheel machine is Terry Chard. Now, luckily we've got him here now. Let's have a chat with him and uh, see what went on behind the scenes to create it. Terry, um, when were you commissioned to build this bike? Uh, originally, I had a month's notice to do it. It was supposedly supposed to be completed in three days, but it took a little longer. Uh, how long, in, in actual fact, did it take from start to finish? Three weeks and uh, an extra week for tidying bits up, really. I'm absolutely amazed to hear you say that. I thought it would take at least six months. I mean, a hell of a lot of work has gone into this thing. Yeah, as uh, you know, um, obviously you don't realise, you know, underneath there is quite a lot of engineering has gone into it, you know. Uh, I think that's quite obvious, actually. Yeah. And is Terry himself quite happy with it? Yeah, I am. I'll be happy if um, Graham gets the record. That's, okay. that's what will make me happy. Right. Now, despite the fact that you're only aiming to go just a little bit over 100 miles an hour or so today, what is this actually capable of? Uh, 150, easily. Sure. Uh, no problem about that, yeah. And do you think Graham will, you know, raise his ambitions to that level in due course? Yeah, I think he will. He'll be around that even more. You know, we, we, we've got a big future plans. We, we've made the frame so we can add a few uh, extra bits on like turbochargers and things like that. So well, the story's only beginning oh, yeah, today then. Yeah, is 100 yeah, miles an yeah. hour nothing? Ah, that's, yeah, it's just warming up. Okay, you're obviously an ambitious character. Thanks very much for your time and uh, congratulations on making such a great looking uh, beast. Cheers, thanks a lot. Okay.
Now we're always going on about performance parts for your fancy machines in the way of brakes and uh, exhaust and bits that make it go quicker. But what about the handling? Well there's loads of different brands and there's loads of different posy things you can buy. Now some of the stuff that you may spend your hard earn on can actually cost you less than the original equipment. And you can buy brands like Shore and Penske, Olins and White Power, there's whole loads of different ones. Now these at the top here are the Penske units. They're quite subtle, they're very nice in the bronzy colour and the black. And you can get them here with a sort of an external adjuster on it. So at least you can show it off to your mates. Because it is true to say that when you spend this sort of money, five or six hundred pounds, very often it's stuck under the seat out of the way. You can't see it. So what people do is they then buy units like this with yellow springs and nice anodized gold units on the side uh, and then white powers of course they're famous for their white springs so they get noticed, they get seen. You can buy something like this, this is for the latest GSXR 750 where it's got all sorts of fancy bits and pieces on it and you've got an adjuster that sits on the outside and that can get noticed by all your mates so at least they can see what you've spent your money on. In respect to costs, five, six hundred, seven hundred pounds very, very easily. But like I say, just bear in mind that if you do have a unit on the back of your machine that is completely cream crackered, it may cost you that much to put an original equipment on it. And not all of them are rebuildable either, whereas aftermarket ones very, very often are. It doesn't just stop at the back of the bike either. You've got to think of the front of the machine. Now, here we are, a basic spring like that that goes into your fork legs. These can cost as little as 40, 50 pounds for a pair and can go up to several hundred depending on how fancy performance you want and what brand they are. So there's a little quick summary of what you can have in the way of shock absorbers units at the back of your bike, fork springs in the front. Do you know, you think of them as very, very costly, five, six hundred pounds or whatever, and you think, who in the right mind is going to spend that on the bike? Well, would you believe an outlet like Demon Tweaks, for example, with mail order system, they sell around 20 units a week. So there are people out there who do spend big bucks on their fancy bits on the bike. But what about this unit? This is the front forks on the front of an R1 that we've put on and they're 1,500 quids worth. Suspension, often talked about, but more often than not, misunderstood. So let's see if we can sort a few things out. Now unlike cars, most bike suspension is adjustable, especially if it's a sports bike like this one. So where do you start? Well, not with the suspension, funnily enough, but with tyres. And why is that? Well, that's because the tyres are part of your suspension. They're pneumatic after all, so pressures are all important. Get yourself a good gauge. When the designer designs your bike, he's not just looking at compounds on the tyres and the, the general design of the tread, he's actually looking at the pressures that the tyre is going to run out and he does it in consultation with the tyre manufacturers. Too soft and it'll be all squidgy. If I put this one down on the ground, you can see that it'll actually deform. I know it's not on the wheel, but nevertheless, I can see inside there, it's actually squashing out, so it deforms. If it's too hard, you end up getting this sort of shape, a really dome shape there, and so you're gonna lose a lot of grip there, a lot of compliance you're gonna lose. And again, it'll affect the handling, so you lost the squidginess, but it'll make it very, very hard. I've chalked a bit of the tire up here, just on that section there, just to show you the sort of contact patch you're gonna get. And if we use my clipboard here, just put the gauge down. I know this might seem a bit unreal, but there we go. If I put the tire there, let's put that on there. That's the piece of road. I know there's no weight on it, but I'm pressing on there with my hand. There's your contact patch. It's not very much, is it? And when you come to the rear tire, it can be even more marked. See this one? This one is well squared off on the top. If I put it down on the floor, it'll probably even stand up. And it very nearly does. It's quite natural for it to be squared off on the top. No matter how fast you're going around corners, no matter how often you get your knee down, most of the time you're going to spend upright. And that's why you end up scrubbing all that centre off, especially if you've got a lot of power with the bike. But look how that will affect your handling. As soon as you go around, start to go around a corner, you get onto that edge there, and then the bike literally falls over. And you'll actually feel that. And you'll also get this white lining business where a flat tyre will pick up any ripples in the road. So that's why your tyres are all important.
time for a break now, but still to come in part two, we'll be rejoining Chris Moss at Bruntingthorpe for the outcome of the world record attempt. And it's the final day of the Moroccan Desert Tour. Welcome back to Two Wheels and still to come on this week's show we'll be getting the final thoughts and impressions of the riders as they conclude their Moroccan desert tour. But first we'll rejoin Chris at Bruntingthorpe to see if they've managed to beat the world speed record for a quad. Right, what Graham Hicks is about to attempt has really been put into context. I just watched him get on the quad now. That alone is difficult, and the guy had problems putting his gloves on. Clearly, that you know that this guy is disabled quite significantly. Yet, despite that, he's going to now run at well over 100 miles an hour at Bruntingthorpe on this quad, not knowing where the hell he's heading, and only aided by the navigator Rob on the back. No, yeah, incredible. Big hand to that guy. And now we're going to talk to one of the uh, organisers of the event. It's Jackie Hicks. She's the chief executive of Deaf Blind UK. Jackie, tell me about this organisation, this charity, and what it's all about, what it hopes to achieve. OK, Deaf Blind UK is a national charity, and it represents the 24,000 deaf blind people in the UK. And we just try to bring them into society and uh, make their lives better than they would be if we weren't around. And what sort of functions do you get involved with in order to raise money? Um, well, this is a bit of a bizarre one. We raise money like other charities do, you know, through sponsorship and getting grants and things like that. Um, but we also have these high profile events because they help to show what you can achieve even if you are deaf blind. Now, you've got a, a bit more than a professional involvement today, haven't you? Graham, the man who is going to attempt to break the record today, is your husband. Uh, how do you feel about him taking part in what seems like uh, quite a risky thing to do? Um, well, there's a part of me that's quite worried about it because there's no doubt it's a dangerous activity but Graham is a man who knows how to handle a bike, he knows how to handle um, a jet ski and as long as he's got somebody on the back who's navigating for him he's as good as anybody else out there so why should I try and stop him? <laughs> OK, we're just part of the way through the attempt now. Things are going pretty well. The wind's proving to be a bit of a problem, but we're just short of 100 miles an hour at the moment. We've already beaten his existing record, but the guys want to carry on until they break the magical tug. And uh, good luck to him. It's an emotive thing to witness. I'm really quite impressed with what Graham and Rob are doing here. All the best. How are we doing now then, Robin? He's gone from that. I mean, that's sig a significant, quicker, significant than his last improvement, run isn't in it? That direction. <laughs> okay. Uh, ten miles an hour difference. So, if he can manage ten, bringing that up to 104. Yeah, that'd be a great that average, would wouldn't be it? hundred and tenish. Yeah. And that'd be great. He, he, he's certain to be happy with that, isn't he? We're averaging 104 on the last two runs. That's pretty good. Well, the wind down there is much worse yes, than it yeah, was. Yeah. And it's throwing us offline. Yeah. I, I mean, Graham can go an awful lot faster. I know, is it you that's so restricting me, it? I just cannot see anything coming up this way. And why is that? Is the wind just the buffeting you too much? Yeah. Buffed in my helmet. And if I'm steering, I've got to move my body weight slightly one side before I tell Graham to steer. Yeah, sure. Otherwise the quad's quite unstable and they yep. can too. You must be pretty chuffed with yourself. I'm really chuffed. Okay. Oh, well done. Thanks a lot. No, very good. I think, Graham, I think Graham's chuffed as well. Right, Graham's just uh, really broken his record there. He's done 104 miles per hour despite the very, very tricky conditions. I don't know even I, as a sighted person, would be happy to do 104 miles an hour today. It's very, very brustery. So let's just have a bit of a talk with him and uh, see how it went.
it took a few runs to get there. When you've got a strong crosswind, you've got to judge you can't know how the bike will behave before you go for it. We've had a bit of practice and we decided it was time to push it a bit harder, so we did. Well, look, I think you're an incredible guy. I don't know how the hell you've done that, but congratulations anyway, and uh, I hope to see you go even faster in the future. Very well done, Graham. Thanks. I think my main message is that deafblindness and many other disabilities are no barrier to achievement in motorsports. After all, it's not just the driver, it's the chap that built the bike who is disabled. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, Graham's a very unselfish guy there. He spoke very highly of both Ch Terry, the builder of the bike, and Rob, who was navigating him today. I think not only is he an example to deaf and blind people, but to society in general. I mean, I feel truly honoured to have witnessed his attempt today. Uh, what a hero! And so we come to the final day of the Moroccan Desert Tour. The last morning for these riders who so far have covered in excess of 600 kilometers over some very challenging terrain. Just time for a quick last check of the bikes and the chance to buy some rather untraditional looking desert souvenirs. How much? How much? 50. How much? 50. 50. No, no. This is Jutta Klein Schmidt's Mitsubishi, see? Main sponsor. They saw the Dakar go through here last year. Or oh, sorry, this year. I copy all the cars. They're nice. Made, they're made from palm. Palm trees. It may be the final day, and it is indeed one of the hottest that the guys have experienced, but that's no excuse for taking shortcuts when it comes to safety. It's still vitally important to wear the correct equipment, layer after layer of it. Last day, the fifth day, it's 90, 99 kilometers off road through the Palmery. And it is through the Palmery the whole way, going through hundreds and hundreds of little villages, kids everywhere, donkeys, dogs, everything. And then it's the last 90 k's on the main road over the high pass and back into Azazate. After five days of riding in the desert, it's a strange feeling to be back on tarmac. Just time for a few final thoughts. Another five days. 
<laughs> <laughs> I could do another week as well, but uh, it feels kind of um, I'm happy it's, it's ending, actually. <laughs> Those last one of the keys were quite cool and windy up, up in the mountains. It was very, very good. <coughs> I'm very, very tired. No. It's brilliant. I really enjoyed it. Best group I've ever had. Lovely people. So fast. <laughs> nice yields. <laughs> <laughs> well, two were over. After his uh, first day of crashing, it all went very well. A few get offs. Uh, Good weather, cold. Apart from the wind coming back on the road for the last 94k, but yep, on the whole, it's all gone very well indeed. Good group. Look at the state of my face. That's all from Two Wheels for this week, but on next week's show, I'll be showing you some of the latest products to hit the marketplace. And Wayne will once again be in his warehouse talking about the kind of things we like to bolt on to our motorcycles. And we'll be joining Jeff at this year's World Ducati Weekend at Bologna in Italy. <laughs>